Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the OneTouch brand, providing diabetes management solutions for people living with diabetes, including the OneTouch Vario Flex blood glucose meter and the OneTouch Reveal mobile app. Taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, meet the Vice President for Outreach for the Night Scout Foundation. Behind that title is quite a story. We'll talk to Weston Nordgren about his son's diagnosis as an infant, their journey to find solutions, and the power of community. I believe when the FDA saw the explosion of Night Scout and that they could not put that genie back in the bottle because it was a movement of tens of thousands before they could even check their email. They brought, worked with Medtronic in bringing to market the 670G three years sooner, which means my son can concentrate with blood sugars in range at school in the fifth grade as opposed to the eighth grade. So that's monumental. Wes recently represented the CGM and the Cloud Group at an exclusive international Facebook conference. We'll talk about that, the we are not waiting sentiment, and find out how his son is doing on that new Medtronic pump. Plus, in our Shop Talk segment, no more chalky glucose tabs, Chris Angel from Glucolift said something had to be done. They just struck me that the people who were making them never had to eat four of them at three in the morning. You know, it made my mouth feel like it was going to turn inside out. They were so hard to get down. Plus, an update on two previous guests, a big race coming up, and some new music released. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Okay, here we go. Welcome to another week of the show. Hi, I'm Stacy. If you're new here on Diabetes Connections, we aim to educate and inspire about type one by sharing stories of connections from actors, authors, athletes, leaders in our community, as well as the healthcare companies and technology folks we count on to push the envelope and help us manage diabetes. And I also love talking to the everyday, always in quotes, everyday people dealing with diabetes in themselves, in their family. My son was diagnosed with type 1 right before he turned 2. He is almost 13 now. My husband has type 2 diabetes. My background is in broadcast journalism. I was a local TV anchor and reporter and radio host for many years, and that's how you get the podcast. I'm excited to bring you this interview with Wes Nordgren. The we are not waiting, you know, it's more than a hashtag. And there's so much going on with the CGM and the cloud group. I'll talk more about that a little bit later on. And if you're not familiar, give you a little bit of information. uh, Because going into that interview, um, there's a couple of things that you'll need to know. And we will definitely get to that. But there's some exciting stuff going on with past guests. And, you know, we've been doing the podcast now for, uh, it was two years in June. So when that happens and, you know, you get to over 120 something episodes, you you know, you start, you know, following the people that you talk to and they're doing these amazing things. So one of those people is Amanda Jo, interviewed her uh, last year for the podcast. And um, she's a up and coming country music singer diagnosed with type one when she was younger. And I saw that their new song, well, Amanda Joe has since teamed up with Billy Lee, and they have a group called Truck Stop Honey, and they released uh, a new album. And I want to play you one of the songs from it, just a, a little snippet of the song. I will link up links to Truck Stop Honey, and you can learn more about it. But this is a song called Polaroid, and I'll tell you the backstory before I play the clip. It's about the last picture Amanda Joe's family had together before her dad was killed by a drunk driver 11 years ago. She wrote on Facebook, It means so much to do this song for my dad. This is the only gift I have left to give him. I hope I make you proud, Dad. Here's a little bit of Polaroid. It ain't a Rembrandt, ain't Picasso, ain't Da Vinci, ain't a Van Gogh. There's no canvas, no brushstroke you could see. But it's a priceless work of art from southern Illinois on a Polaroid. 
Isn't that great? Oh, it's just beautiful. And it's just a great thought. Such a sad story, but a beautiful song. I will link up more information about Amanda Joe and Billy Lee and Truck Stop Honey. And you can download the music. It's it'll all be there for you. Before we go any further, I need to bring you up to date on one of our sponsors. You've heard me talk about Animus for a long time here. And as you may have heard, it was in the news quite a bit recently, Animus Corporation is exiting the insulin pump business. There is an awful lot of information here, especially important to current Animus users. So I will direct you to their website. Just go to Animus patientsupport.com. I am also going to be linking that up in the show notes. Um, It's really important that you read through everything here, a lot of good information. I'm really sad to bring you that news, not just because we have used and loved the Animus products for so many years. You know, it was the the first uh, insulin pump that we got for Benny when he was two. It's the only one we used for more than 10 years. I'll be talking about this a lot more. I've asked the folks from Animus to come on. But in the meantime, I'm very excited to let you know that One Touch has agreed to stay on as our sponsor for the podcast. So I'm going to be telling you more about their products and about our great experience with them starting this week, starting right now. One Touch has been a trusted brand in blood glucose management for more than 30 years. And this year, U.S. News and World Report named One Touch the number one pharmacist recommended in blood glucose monitoring devices and lancets based on a survey of pharmacists nationwide. Find out more about One Touch brand products at diabetes-connections.com and click on the One Touch logo. I said at the beginning of the show, we were catching up on a couple of previous guests, and I have my fingers crossed and my toes crossed and everything else I can and, and wishing good luck and everything to Ross Baker. Do you remember Ross? I called him the T1D's marathon man in the promotional stuff for the episode when I put it out because Ross is incredible. Ross is about to I don't know, should I jinx it? Okay, I'll set it up differently. Ross's goal is to run a marathon in every U.S. state, all 50 states, and Washington, D.C. And he has one left. And oh, yeah, he has type 1 diabetes. Ross is incredible. I was nervous. I feel like I'm invested in him now. He did a big bike event this summer and some other stuff. And I was like, don't get hurt. What are you, crazy? So the event is October 15th. It's the Maui Marathon in Hawaii. Talk about a big finish. So we are rooting you on. I'll be putting out some stuff on social media. Please watch for that on the Diabetes Connections Facebook page and our Twitter feed. I am in awe of Ross. Uh, He feels that he was called to do this. You know, he was always a runner. You can go back and listen to the episode. But he felt that this was something that he was meant to do. It's a lovely story. He's an incredible guy. He lives here in my town in Charlotte. And you may have seen him. He wears an Omnipod on his chest. I just, I still like, I don't know how people do that. I know a lot of people do that. But when I see those pictures, it's like, oh my gosh, good for him. So I'll keep you posted on that. But what an incredible story. So again, Wow, October 15th, Ross, we will be cheering for you at the Maui Marathon. Want to say a word about another sponsor, about Dexcom. And you know we've been dealing with type 1 diabetes for more than 10 years now. Benny was diagnosed in 2006, and I'd heard about the teen years, you know, but like a lot of parents, I thought we'd be different. Isn't that nice? Well, here we are. And here comes some incredible physical changes and wild hormone swings. I cannot imagine managing diabetes during this crazy time without the Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring system. We can react more quickly to highs and lows and adjust insulin doses with advice from our endocrinologist, which, as an aside, we have done so much more often in the past 18 months than ever before. Uh, these teen hormones are, they are not to be believed. I know the G5 Mobile is helping to improve Benny's A1C without a doubt. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration, may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to diabetes-connections and click on the Dexcom logo. My guest this week is Weston Nordgren. He is the Vice President for Outreach for the Night Scout Foundation. And we've talked to a lot of people from Night Scout, from CGM in the Cloud, the We Are Not Waiting movement. And I'd urge you, if you're new to the show, go back and listen to some of those interviews. We do have a big search box at diabetes-connections.com, and you can put in Night Scout or Cloud for CGM in the Cloud, and it'll come up. 
I think you need to know a few things before we jump right in. First, let me just give you a quick definition of Night Scout. And they have a great one on their website, so I'm just going to read it off of that. Night Scout was developed by parents of children with type 1 diabetes and has continued to be developed, maintained, and supported by volunteers. When first implemented, Night Scout was a solution specifically for remote monitoring of Dexcom G4 CGM data. Today, there are Night Scout solutions available for Dexcom G4, Dexcom Share with Android, Dexcom Share G5, and Medtronic. Night Scout also provides browser-based visualization for open APS users and loop users. The goal of the project is to allow remote monitoring of a T1D's glucose level using existing monitoring devices. So that's what Night Scout is. And then CGM in the cloud is the Facebook group that some of the very first people putting together Night Scout for themselves and trying to help other people started, you know, with like 10 people. Uh, the episode with Jason Adams explains how CGM in the cloud was started. But all you really need to know now is that it's a gigantic Facebook group where people from all over the world help each other with this do-it-yourself kind of technology. Open APS and loop are words we throw around quite a bit as well. Uh, the best definition I can give, open APS is an artificial pancreas system, first developed by Dana Lewis and Scott Librand. They're married and they are fantastic. And this was a system using, again, existing technology, but taking it to another level that uh, is not commercially available. And it's open because it's open source. They make the codes available. People who want to do it can. So you can always search the uh, the hashtag OpenAPS, or you can search through it for our website as well. And Loop is a similar program, I want to say, that uses an iPhone to um, help your pump and CGM communicate, but it's not a closed loop entirely. I apologize if that's not the best definition. I'm not quite as familiar with Loop, but all of these things are Googleable. <laughs> And go to CGM in the cloud, and they will help you out for sure. I know for some of you, this was a retread of what you already know. But as you know, unfortunately, new people are joining our community every day. And I don't think it's fair to jump into this interview without at least setting it up a little bit. I also need to tell you, Wes can drop names faster than, give me a good cliche here, faster than a T1D toddler's blood sugar drops in a bounce house. Um, it's not a bad thing. He's trying to thank all of the people that have helped him and have helped so many of us. But there are a lot of names in this interview, some of which I do not explain. And I apologize for that as a listener. I can't stand when that happens. But please forgive me. There are a lot and they go by quickly. Okay, so let's get to my interview with Wes Nordgren. Wes, I am so glad you could join me. I know how busy you are. Thanks for making some time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Stacey. Glad to be here. So let's talk about Night Scout. Let's just start right there. I think many people who who know you and maybe only know you from social media know that you are community outreach for uh, Night Scout. How did you get involved with Night Scout in the first place? Well, as James Wedding and I, we owe everything to our wives. <laughs> They're the ones who were doing the perpetual research. I was content to wait for the cure because it was only five years away. Hmm. Uh, James was angry. And so our wives ran across the picture of John Costick when he tweeted out the watch face. And uh, so my wife pretty much wrangled me <laughs> into the scenario, which I'm very grateful for because she's a fierce warrior mother. And if we look across the community, our community is made up 75 percent of those very same fierce warrior mothers. When you say, you know, you and James, and I've interviewed James before as the president of the Night Scout Foundation, both have kids with type 1. What happened at first? Because at the very beginnings of this, there were a couple of people who, again, saw John Costick's tweet, who knew the technology might be there, but didn't have a good way to find each other. What did you guys do? How did you get the ball rolling? Well, there were quite a few people doing the same thing that L Lane Desbro and John Costick were doing, but very quietly, uh, as Kevin Lee and uh, Ben West and some of the others. And so it's Ben West who everyone was emailing back and forth between Jason Calabrese and Ross Naylor and Lane Desbro, John Costick, and everyone – and Kevin Lee, and they were all emailing back and forth. And so Ben set up 
the Git repository where all the code would be, he set up the Night Scout project. And so Jason Adams is the one that started with five families. And on April 27th of 2014, started the Facebook group. And then the growth, the exponential growth of that group is uh, is historical. Yeah. And we have done a whole episode with Jason about how that group came to be. And he did not expect it to no. be what it is now. How many how many people are in that group now, that Facebook group? Uh, 24,000 plus, and we have 43,000 plus worldwide in 31 different country groups. And we also have five specialty subgroups, uh, one of which is Night Scout for Medtronic, which is exploding in growth because of the 670G. So if Medtronic gets anywhere near their target numbers, we could see a tripling of the CGM in the cloud scenario. Wow. What do you think it was at first? You know, this the Night Scout Foundation. It's different from the technology. It's different from the the original. I don't want to say intent, but I, I guess I'll just ask it like this: What were you all hoping to accomplish with the foundation? Why did you need something like that? Well, the foundation basically is put into place for a corporate entity. As James is famous as saying, Microsoft can't deal with seven people on the internet. Or as he would say, seven guys, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> there's guys and gals. So one of the things it does is it's a corporate presence, it's a corporate contact, and that has been very beneficial for the development. It supports open source technologies, as Jason Adams set up CGM in the cloud as opposed to Dexcom in the cloud because there would be many CGMs, uh, James set up the foundation in support of all open source that help those with T1D. So we're also talking this supporting open APS, Loop, Android APS, the other projects. And there's a myriad of different projects. One of the things that we do with the developers is we have the uh, bi semi-annual uh, hackathons where everybody gets together. The first one was a year ago. We had another one last June. They're really wonderful because you get all of the brain trust for that certain location and everybody gets together. And instead of somebody saying, tomorrow I'm going to contact Steve and see if run this by him, if it'll work, you can just say, hang on just a minute. Let me grab Steve from the desk over there. <laughs> and then it, so it's an accelerator. It accelerates the perpetual developing. And the developers have done this with their own sweat, blood, and treasure. And at the foundation, the financing thus far is, is basically the $10 bumper stickers. So there's not an awful lot, but there is some. And so putting on these hackathons was a vision of James. And I think it was probably the best thing that the foundation has ever done. Now we're going to be having an international one in Prague with the European developers, because we have a huge European developer presence, probably because the medical device industry has hired away so many of the developers, original Night Scout developers, which we are, that's just a wonderful thing, because then you get Ben West and Chris Hanselman, you get them in Hanneman in Dexcom and you get John at Beta Bionics and you have Lane and Ross and Kevin over in Bigfoot Biomedical. So you see the seeds that were sown back in 2012 and 2013 taking root and growing. And the European developers are relatively safe because of the location barriers of the U.S. companies. Uh, however, the Android APS uh, Milos that did that, he has been contacted by a pump company to do their APS for their commercial release. Wow. So, yeah. So this is just amazing. And all of the different open source automated insulin delivery programs like Loop and Open APS and Android APS, 
have brought to bear the possibility of doing these things. And this is a bunch of sleep deprived individuals and parents <laughs> self funding. And as I said in the Diabetes Mind interview, it's like, you take your millions and billions and your boardrooms and your project teams and your infrastructure and, and take this over so we can retire before you do. But they don't have the passion that we do. Well, they don't have the stake. They do at Bigfoot Biomedical. Well, they, they do, do at Beta <laughs> they do Bionics. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, you look at you do you look at Beta Bionics, and when I look back at when when Benny was diagnosed ten years ago, almost eleven now, geez, that was the one that I thought would really succeed because the person running it, Ed Damiano, his kid has type one, and he has the knowledge and the resources and the company. But now, as you say, there are these other companies, and and Bigfoot didn't really higher they kind of created with the passion because the four founders all have family members with type one or have type one themselves as you sure. say it's pushing this along to me as a person who really is not technically minded that's to me going to be the gift of night scout and i could be way off here but it seems to me that you all are pushing it's that you know the we are not waiting you're showing it can be done opening it up to the public to say we don't know what's going on at this at this company but we can do this here so why aren't they doing it and then we've seen over the last couple of years they are doing it and they are bringing it to public do you see it the same way from where you sit well i i do know that so much of this everyone stands on the shoulders of giants mm. we all stand on ben west's shoulders on dana lewis on scott lebrand on nate raycliffe and pete schwamm we all stand on their shoulders as we do the advocacy as milos as he's taking open aps and creating android aps there's this rich community of sharing and open source and it is a wonderful thing and I believe, this is just my personal belief, that when the FDA saw the explosion of Night Scout and that they could not put that genie back <laughs> in the bottle because it was a movement of tens of thousands before they could even check their email, I truly believe that Courtney and Stacy at the FDA, they're extremely fundamental and integral to this process because they brought worked with Medtronic in bringing to market the 670G three years sooner, which means my son can concentrate with blood sugars in range at school in the fifth grade as opposed to the eighth grade. So that's monumental. I want to talk about your family and your son and your family's story, but I got to say, Wes, it's hard to keep up with the names here. Can you tell me a little bit about Stacy and Courtney when you mentioned those women at the FDA? You know, what do they do? Why were they important? When we think about the FDA, we think about the stuffy bureaucracy set in stone in the 1968 time period. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, this is probably going to be super unpopular, but they probably were like Medicare back in the day. But when they saw the advancements and how fast these things were moving, they moved too. I mean, they proactively went out and contacted Medtronic. Mm. So that is something e extremely impressive. They have worked very well with Dexcom and quick approvals. In fact, everybody used to say the FDA is holding it up. The FDA is holding it up. Well, when Amy from Diabetes Mine put together D-Data and brought together the hackers and industry and the FDA all in one room back in 2013 and, and uh, twice each year since that time, we learned that it wasn't the FDA holding them up, but the FDA was a common excuse for industry. Hmm. So we learned that once a software program was approved, if they were to make modifications to it, it didn't require going back to the FDA. They could just release that. So then everybody turned their attention to industry. In fact, the FDA has been a wonderful partner in this to the point that we're now seeing where the other roadblocks are. For example, the G5, the community got together the FDA moved forward and the G5 was approved for therapy. But no one thought we should get Medicare on board sooner than later. So then you get to the point where we have a product ready to ship, but we have a problem with the payer. 
and we're currently seeing the very same thing with the express approval of the 670G is you have Anthem saying no. So that's holding up a lot of people from getting that. So these quick approvals are wonderful and it helps us refocus our attention on the next log jam. How effective our community will be in working with those areas has yet to be seen, but I sure hope that Dexcom and Medtronic <laughs> are working double duty. But I wish they would have been doing all of these things prior to. So, yeah. Well, we could talk, and I, I could go through every company with you probably, and maybe we will in a little bit because you do have a lot of information. But before we go down that road, let's go back. You mentioned your son. You have a unique family story. You and your wife have been together for more than 30 years. You have, Correct. you have, you have what, five kids? You have grandchildren? Tell me your right. story. You're on your, your second generation of kiddos. We are. My wife and I grew up around the corner from each other in Tempe, Arizona, and we did not really take notice of each other. <laughs> we did date in our teens off and on, but it was nothing ever serious or for an extended period of time. And then in the mid eighties, we got together and, and realized that, Hey, you know, this is, this is really working. This is, we were best friends. So that's probably the foundation. This month we're celebrating 32 years together. So we had two children. We planned them around the heat in Arizona. We, planned them four years apart so they could each be grow up as individual singletons. And, you know, it was one of these things where planning was the big thing. And then you get the second generation where we've, we adopted three special needs children and the twins and our son Derek are three years apart. So when our daughter, our son had already gone off to college. Our daughter was preparing for college and I was preparing to empty nest trying to figure out, hey, what am I going to do with their rooms? Because we already have home offices in our house. You know, it's like, d d is it a media room for me? <laughs> so my wife was thinking, how can we do the greatest good for for humanity? And so she basically popped the question, you know, what did I think about adoption? And I just burst out laughing. It was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> I was... I was in my mid to late 40s, and it was like, uh, you know, it was like, it was, it's a good thing, you know. Uh, what's what's your wife's I'm, name? What's your wife's name? My wife's name is Colleen. Okay. And so we were driving on this <laughs> this lonely desert highway when she said that to me, and I just burst out laughing, and then it was just like dead silent. And then I seriously felt like I had offended the universe. Like, whatever was out there that was pushing my wife towards uh, doing something more than playing bridge at the country club, um, and so I was just silent. And then I said, well, I think it's a good thing, you know, maybe after 10 years or so, we should look into that. <laughs> and so... As with everything good in uh, my life, she helped me see j the importance of it. And so she worked with me for months and months. And we went through special training specifically to first foster these special needs children because it was the only way we could get them from birth and then to adopt them. And so that's basically how we came into the second generation. And so we've seen the singleton raising singletons and now we've got the kids all together. And I have to say there's lots of benefits to raising singletons and there's lots of benefits of having the children closer together so that there's a camaraderie in between them, that there's not too much time. Do you feel like you're, you're, you, know, you burst out laughing do you feel like the universe is okay with you now? Do you feel like that, that's worked out? I mean, you've got to still be laughing a lot. <laughs> well, I'm laughing all the time. I'm laughing all the time because I literally, you know, thought about what's the worst case scenario here. And it, and basically, I've never been disappointed. You know, I've never th said to myself, I didn't know it was going to be this hard because I figured it'd be the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Wow. And so, but just the sheer joy that our second generation has 
when they wake up in the morning uh, with all of the special needs that they have, with all of the obstacles they have, with all of the challenges they have, just to see the joy on their face. And it's like, you know, it's like, am I in a crabby mood today because something didn't go right on <laughs> some part of work? And it's like, it's a reality check. Yeah. It's just seriously a reality check. And Derek is in fifth grade. He's he's nine. He's ten. He's ten years old. Diagnosed at twelve months, and uh, diagnosed by my wife because the doctor pronounced him healthy three days before he was airvac to the children's hospital. But he already he, had other other issues, right? Yes, he has a laundry list. He has um, partial chromosomes and just that alone is a laundry list of 19 different things and he has epilepsy and and a lot of other uh all of the children's birth mothers made extremely poor decisions during the pregnancy uh in regards to drugs and alcohol and uh really heavy narcotics that have caused lots of problems for the kids but I can tell you they're just the happiest people on earth. So he he was in that bad shape three yeah, days his, after. Yeah, his blood glucose was about his blood glucose was about thirteen times normal and so and he, like I said, it's in the diabetes mine article I have a little tally of, you know, uh, mom's radar. <laughs> probably today sits at two thousand five hundred. I probably have twelve. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many that doctor has, because that doctor's last day was the day he was Aravac. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. We, you know, and that's another thing is. Oh, let's that say with you. Yeah, we <laughs> drive by three different uh, children's hospitals uh, on our way to our endocrinologist because these children's hospitals have a, a major specialty. So for. Um, neurology we go to ucla children's we if it's if it's gastroparesis we're going to uh, los angeles and then we go down to orange county for our uh, endocrinologist mm. basically that's my job my job is to get the family to these experts and uh, that my wife has found and and uh, made sure they're the best for the kids and has that worked out pretty well? I mean, I, I would far be it for me to doubt your wife. I'm just, you know, has, I mean, and you're driving all over the place. The kids are each pretty much where they need to be. You're comfortable with the care they're all getting. Yeah. It, knowing that the children and it's, and it's night and day difference. Mm -hmm. You know, we have pediatric endocrinologists in town and it's not, when we got to the ultimate specialist for our family, there's, you know, I'm, there's quite a few, I'm sure it was like the difference talking technology with them between showing fire to someone who's never seen it before and talking about the next moon launch. Wow. And it was such an improvement in the quality of life for the entire family. And if you know California, you'll know that Orange County is about 11 miles from Disneyland. So when we do these quarterly trips, we always throw in a fun time <laughs> Kids are, you know, it's road trip. In fact, if we have to push an appointment, they're usually sad because they really enjoy yeah. the family playlist, and loud music, all kinds <laughs> of fun. We have the fancy shopping mall near our endocrinology office. It's about a 45 minute drive. But the only fun thing would be for me to go shopping and my 12 year old son isn't exactly psyched about, you know, walking <laughs> around the fancy South Park mall there. So Disneyland would definitely be a bigger hit. So you you have used um, I found out recently a few different insulin pumps on your kiddo in the last few years. Right. Do you mind sharing some of that? Because I want to talk about your recent switch to Medtronic 670 because you're very being very public about that. But why the switches throughout? Do you mind talking a little bit about sure. what you started with? Well, we did a lot of research. Like people that uh, are new to type 1 diabetes, we did a lot of research. And when I say we, I mean my wife told me a lot about the research she was doing. And we did not necessarily like Medtronic, but we were getting the most doctors telling us to go for Medtronic. We were actually leaning towards Omnipod. So when he was 12 months, we got the Medtronic 722 and this Harpoon 
and these really, really bad uh, accuracy and light sensors mm-hmm. that we had to harpoon our child with. And we did that for 90 days. And my wife just said, I'm not doing this to my son. And so she <laughs> she went to back to the insurance company and said, I need a different pump. And they were like, no. And she says, yes. And so she fought with them for <laughs> three ap- appeals. And they finally said, OK, we'll you know, you can have the Omnipod. And we had to go to the Omnipod. Not only was the Medtronic just the wrong thing for an infant, but he is immensely intrigued by electronics because mm. at his birth by the time he was about six seven eight months the iphone was being handed down the 2007 iphone was being handed down and the next generation was what i was using so he was doing the touch screen and he was doing the flash cards and he he actually taught himself to read at three and a half years old wow. And he had like 600 flashcards. He had phonic programs. And these were things we thought, hey, let's put these on and they'll be good sometime. And one day he just started reading things in the house. But (laughs) one of the things that since he was so enamored with technology, he loved his pump. He loved to take his pump out. And we had pump pockets. And so we had to start putting his pump in a little zip pack. And then he would unzip it. So then we had to start locking it. And then he he had eight hours at night to use his teeth to breach the zipper itself. Like with luggage, you can push a quarter in. So he would do that with his teeth. Uh, And (laughs) his little hands had 18 months would fall onto the unlock keys because when he held the pump, that's where his, they would fall. And oh. we caught him in a bolus one morning. And so that's where my wife was. And that's the motivation for her to go back to the insurance company and say, this is the life of my child. So we got the Omnipod and the Omnipod worked great until kindergarten and we couldn't keep it on. You know, we used every method known to man to keep that on, but we could not keep it on. So she went back to the insurance company and we got Animus Ping and we used that. Uh, developmentally, uh, our son is ages about half of his uh, chronological age. So the nurse in first grade wanted him to do all of his own D care so it would be easier on her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and so she showed him the pump and how to bolus himself, and so we found out about that and put a stop to that because he wasn't, at first grade, he just was not understanding what he was doing, but we were perpetually finding changes in the pump. So we, my wife went back to the insurance company. They must love her. They're like, "Uh uh-oh, here comes Colleen. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. And so she went back again, and all of these involved at least three appeals. They just all did. And so we went back on to Omnipod because it was the only thing. We were actually looking at Tandem. We made the decision. We were going for it. And just before we signed, my wife said, what is your lockout sequence? And they said, yeah, the lockout sequence is hard-coded in. No worries. Yeah, what's the lockout sequence? One, two, three. Oh, great. So we had to abandon ship, go back to Omnipod, which we did until we went back to the very first pump that we ever had, the Medtronic 722, and we used that with Loop. And we used that for nine months with Loop with just amazing results. That's when we got our first taste of closed Loop. I had been closely following uh, Mark Wilson, Dana, Scott, Ben, Nate, as they were doing all of this development, you know, spending conferences, spending into the wee hours talking to them about which of all these systems would be best. Cause there were a lot of different options, but I only had one little guy. Yeah. yeah. So I took a sabbatical when we decided to flip the switch. And for 30 days, my wife and I did shifts. And we never took our eyes off uh, the loop. And so someone was either physically watching Night Scout in the monitoring. So right there, remote monitoring for us yet again was so important because now it wasn't just the CGM number we needed. We needed to be able to see all the different pieces 
of the algorithm and were they working properly? Well, we didn't have any problems. We had two mini scenarios that would have, what, that are laughable in relation to T1D as a whole. If very early on, they were taken care of very quickly. And our son went from his worst A1C to his best A1C yeah. in ninth days. And every day he would go to school, he would walk away from the Riley link, which uh, Pete Schwamm did that makes it communicate the pump with the CGM and it would revert to a normal Medtronic 722. The school perpetually had him between two and 300 or crashing. And so he just wasn't getting the opportunity he deserved and needed to learn. So, and we not only were we unable to use loop at school, but I had zero confidence that they would not have a fatal event. So we just had to stumble through until we could get the 670G. And it was an interesting thing. I was very anti-Medtronic. I mean, very anti-Medtronic. In fact, I was the one that did the meme that said uh, the Medtronic 860. It was a futuristic pump. It said, you will be simula- simulated. <laughs> and it had Borg in the yeah. meme, you know. So, but I was contacted by Dana Lewis and Scott LeBrand separately, and they said, this is going to be a great thing. The DIY solution is not going to reach the millions that are in need of this respite. This is really a good thing. So I took a second look, and it took me months to stop loathing the idea of having a Medtronic pump again. And I, when I did the interview with Jason Gensler, that uh, is one of your podcasts, I realized through that interview and uh, talking to him offline that he was getting very similar results that we were getting with Loop. And basically, I was willing to trade away all of the 5.5 A1Cs for a 7 A1C if I could get to Loop at school. So we went on to the pathway program. We've been using the 670G f- uh, for one month. We've had two weeks in auto mode. The first week was fantastic because I took all of our loop knowledge and applied it. Ah. And it, I, it was just wonderful. The second week was uh, T1D. In fact, in the next day or two, we're releasing our second episode on this, and it's called T1D Strikes Back. <laughs> and so we we had in a series of three days we had a pump that was not unsuspended from the shower we have a cannula that came off uh and we have a, a air bubble in the tubing and those all went on long enough that he was into the stratosphere uh-huh. but stratosphere you know it, it was under 400 but it was it, you know he was like 385 or whatnot yeah, so sure. he, didn't get it, you know, after breakfast, not having insulin, I guess, is a bad thing when you have to. Yeah. yeah, here. So, but even with that, those two weeks are still running. The good and the bad are running about 6.7. Wow. So I figure anything seven or below is wonderful. A lot of people say, well, I don't want a target of 120. It's too high. But a 120 is a five, a high five A1C. So it's going to reach the millions that we cannot reach. I, I do think that, you know, and there are dis- detractors of, of all things. I mean, we can, we could do a whole show on that, but um, I, I, I'm amazed when I see how well many people have said the hybrid closed loops are working and not just the Medtronic, but you know, some of the ones that are in studies right now and, and that will hopefully come out in the next couple of years. But I'm really right. glad that you've had such a good experience so far. What is the biggest challenge uh, for you? When, when we ran that interview with Jason Gensler and, and very nice job on the interview. I'm so glad you, you made that available for us. I really appreciate that. But when you, when you talk to him, he had, he had explained things that, you know, it wasn't automatic. It wasn't like you just put it on and set it and, and forget it. What I don't know if it surprised you because you had used the loop system for a while, but what should people know? How isn't it automatic? What is it? What do you need to do? Well, you still have to count carbs and you still have to bolus. But the interesting thing about it is 
if you join, once you have the 670G and go into auto mode, if you join his group, the 670 user group, right. you will actually get the information you need to avoid six months of hell. <laughs> as, as he put it, I don't know if those were his words, but I'm paraphrasing. And that's a great thing because he created this community that very much similar to the CGM and the cloud where people came together to support it. And so our experience with it was we knew a lot of things from Loop. Basically, Loop was the reason we had such quick success with it. But the people that come from MDI and go to the 670G have a higher rate of success than people who have had pumps before because everything you know about a pump is wrong when it comes to having to trust an algorithm. Hmm. And so that's the thing. You have to see that, you you know, your blood sugar could be plunging. And so your instinct is to carb. And you probably carbed at a certain level so that you didn't get too low. Well, the algorithm, if you carb while the algorithm's trying to solve that problem, is just awful. It's horrid. You're just creating yourself a nightmare scenario. So you have to trust the algorithm. And we had been through that with Loop. But you have to have enough good information into the pump during your manual mode where it's learning your insulin to carb ratio and your total insulin need. It needs to know that really well or it's not going to have the good information to stop that fast drop or that fast climb. So that's where we spent two weeks in auto uh, in manual mode, whereas most people may only need to spend four days. I saw some very brilliant people in the community uh, use the pump for just a few days and go into auto mode, and they experienced a lot of the problems that Jason was trying to tell everyone, the, do these steps and you're going to have a lot better better time at it. But our ability to have school with him in range is just – it's worth the price of admission. Okay. And I do have to say that there's been, uh, let's see, two or three of our friends in the open source community who, who have really been chagrined that we're, we're, we're talking about this, the 670G. But we're talking about the 670G being a solution because we have Night Scout to monitor it. We would not be on the 670G without Night Scout. Right. And that's a great point, because you all have developed a way to see remotely what the CGM is telling you. This is not Medtronic doesn't provide that. No, Leonard from Australia, Leonard Goodart, developed this. And it is a wonderful thing because, one, the pump is not loud enough Mm. and it's loud enough to annoy the user, but nowhere near loud enough for a parent to hear it in the room next door. So with Night Scout, our endocrinologist actually cautioned us. She says, I am cautioning everyone to not do the 670G. I have two families on Night Scout. I'm allowing them to do that. I'm supporting them in doing that because they're going to be able to, to see it remotely. Because if you don't do certain steps, which are calibrations, you can get kicked out of auto mode. So you go back to a normal pump, and if you're a child, you may not know what that even means. And if you're a teenager, you may not be paying attention. <laughs> so as with everything, you know, being able to glance at your your watch and see your Night Scout info or just having the alarm set. There's lots of people in these groups, uh, 670G support groups, that are just pulling their hair out because they can't hear the alarms. They're getting kicked out in the middle of the night. They don't know it. They're waking up at 385, 400. And those are events where a night scout would alarm mm. and let you know you need to fix this before you get kicked out of auto mode. Well, I'm going to refer people, and I'll link it up in the show notes, to your updates uh, on your son and your experience with the Medtronic. But I have to ask you, before we go too much further here, sure. about – the, the big Facebook group meeting that you went to um, over the summer. 
My understanding yes. is that CGM in the cloud, you were all invited to a Facebook national or international group meeting. What was that all about? And, and why did they single out the group? Well, I have to, first of all, uh, Melinda Wedding. James's wife is the one that first tipped me off that they were looking for extraordinary groups. Mm. They had gone through and they had picked groups that they knew were extraordinary. It was an international event, uh, groups from all over the world. And so Melinda said, you know, surely we have this story. Yeah, <laughs> and I was no like, doubt. Thank you very much. So I, so I wrote up an essay and why our group was extraordinary and sent it in. And we were one of, uh, let's see, there was 130 people. You could each bring three. So it was an event that did not have a lot of people involved, but we were honored to be able to go and represent the community, Kate Farnsworth, Lori Schwartz, and myself. And it was an amazing, amazing event. Facebook, when we started, we were only a few weeks into it when we all realized we have to move this off of Facebook and go to a forum mm. where we can do tech support properly, where we can do all of this properly. But the sleep deprived parents that were coming into the group by the thousands did not follow. We had 35 people go to the forums and we had like 7,000 people at the time. So we had to do all of this support from this giant vacuum of a container where thousands of people were poured in on top of about 15 to 25 to 50 support people from around the world. And it's one of those things where you had to have people paying it forward for this idea to even work because it would be like utter chaos normally. In fact, there we didn't even have an argument in the group between anyone in the feeds until we had about 9,000 people. <laughs> and so it really shows just how much heart everybody brought to it. So, we were in this training and it was basically Facebook coming out to say, we've changed our mission. We, we have seen what you have done without our help in, in making these large groups. Now we're going to help you. In fact, we're changing our mission statement. Wow. We're changing the purpose of our corporation. And so that was, that was amazing. And, you know, I, I can't say I love Facebook. But I love that Facebook recognized that. And there's so many, so many wonderful people at Facebook. We met so many people that were just top tier. Uh, it was just a fantastic experience. And then they ran us through uh, multiple days of seminars where they would have their top person from the company, whether a senior VP or whatnot. And then they would have from the industry at large, whoever was their peer. So if it was like a motivational scenario, you would have this world famous uh, motivational speaker and oh, they wow. would get together and they would teach us what we could do to apply new tools. And I was looking at that and I was thinking this type of conference and training, if I was to send employees to this, it would just be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars, like five grand for a couple of days. So not only was that of great value, but also they paid for everything. They basically brought Silicon Valley, everything you hear about working at Silicon Valley, where, you know, the fridges are stocked and there's always <laughs> food and there's always this and there's entertainment. And that was basically it. So it was kind of fun to uh, experience that. And it was basically the only time we were at a conference where we weren't sitting up until two in the morning in the <laughs> motel lobby next to the door that kept swooshing open and shut, trying to do slides and talking about our presentation the next day as we would cart the booth down and set up <laughs> within, you know, a hundred degree weather because the air conditioning's not on in the expo hall. So it was so 
different from our normal experience that it was refreshing. And after it's all said and done, they owed our community something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get anything out of it in, that changed the group or the way it operates behind the scenes? Did you, you feel like you really learned a lot about how it all works at Facebook? There are so many tools in the pipeline that we're going to have access to that is going to make running a large group much, much easier. In fact, we're probably going to be able to stitch the world back together into one great group without it affecting the operation of the subgroups. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, this is this is monumental. And they had like case scenarios where one group had a million people. Jeez. You know, and, and one group had 370 subgroups. So it really, really gave us food for thought on what we could do in turning a support group back into our everything group. Yeah. You see, it's it's funny because from where I sit, a lot of podcasters start a group, a Facebook group for their show. But I'm in the position where I'd kind of like to do that. But I almost feel like it's just another something, you know, it's already out there because there are so many diabetes groups. You have a parent diabetes right. group, you have a, you know, for, for little kids, you have a, you know, a toddler, you have CGM in the cloud. You have, I almost feel like if I start a Facebook group, it's got to be something more unique or something, you know, what's the point to promote the show? That doesn't make any sense. We're trying to get information out there. It's, it's just an interesting question when you you know do you start a group i'd love to know more about what what is coming so i'll be looking forward to that that's that's fascinating stuff wes i really appreciate that yeah i have to agree with what you said in fact we did not want to start the uh off topic group no. we would refer we would refer people to all of these other wonderful groups that were out there but people wouldn't go <laughs> and, and so finally someone uh, the, a lot of people from the Swedish group said, we miss the heart. We miss, we miss the dialogues, yeah. the, just the normal everyday stuff. And so we said, okay, we'll give it a shot. And so then we started it up and basically people would say, thank you. We wanted the people that were helping us here to, to help us over on the other side. Also, everything else diabetes related. Yeah, I'm in both of those groups. And it's a, the off topic group is a really good one, because you do have questions that aren't technical. And, and the, there's such great people that want to help. Maybe I'll make a group and it'll just be, you know, this week's topic. But nobody, there you go. but nobody stays to topic. Who am I kidding? <laughs> people will be screaming and yelling about i do it this way you're doing it wrong you're doing it right you know we'll see maybe we'll do it Wes. there's so much that you are doing you, you're so busy and you have your hands in all these different great projects did i miss anything you wanted to talk about at least today well you know it's one of those things where there is so many moving parts that uh you you talk about what's in front of you what's in the eye line and uh, so I'm sure there's other things. We just forgot about it. We do have the uh, Facebook, the Night Scout Foundation Facebook page where you can go and you can get updates on all of the conferences. You can get updates on the 670G trials. We will also, as the other APSs come out, we will either be uh, doing similar programs in regards to that, or we'll be interviewing people with those. We have people in the group that have done the uh, tandem uh, pivotal trials, the horizon pivotal trials with Insulet, and they have had wonderful results. So we really look forward to everyone coming out and the design alone of the generation four uh, dual hormone beta bionics uh, although so many people were sad they couldn't get it this year, that's one of those things that I just have uh, on my shelf as a reminder. This is going to rock. Yeah. And also the Bigfoot Biomedical with the Abbott uh, sensor. That's going to be an amazing thing because you're not going to have to calibrate that. Yeah. You have to remember, if you have a teenager – I've had a teenager without T1. I never had to remind him to do something that was life-saving other than, um, let's see, don't walk out into the road, put your seatbelt on. Right. But if you could take a, a G5 or a, or a Guardian 3 and never have to calibrate it, because those nice nine mards 
the accuracy levels are those are only if you calibrate properly every day. Right. Right. You know, two or three times a day. So there's all of this really exciting technology coming out. And our job is in part is to be the town crier. And with a group so large, you know, we're just perpetually trying and uh, trying new things. And uh, sometimes you feel like you're under 200 feet of water <laughs> when you're trying to let people know about these technologies. Because with a worldwide development community, we have more solutions than people are aware of. So getting the word out is and you're helping in that. So we appreciate that greatly. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's it's very selfish of me. I like to know stuff, and I want to know what's coming for my kiddo. So I appreciate it, Wes. But you all are, are doing amazing things. And as I said, I think you've pushed the whole community and uh, and the corporate stuff along. And when we look back on this, I, I really do think these last few years will have been a, a huge and seminal change for the diabetes community in a large part because of the people at Night Scout. So, th- so thank you for everything that you have done. I, I can't I can't say it enough. I really appreciate it. And thank Colleen, because really, it's her fault. So tell her we said hi. (laughs) I will. I certainly will. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. A lot of information in that interview. Wes and Colleen have a lot going on. Oh, my goodness. So I'll try to link up as much as I can in the show notes. You can always start at the Night Scout Foundation homepage or CGM in the cloud, and I will definitely link those pages up as well so you can get some easy access. He is uh, he's unbelievable. I mean, that family is just remarkable. It's always great to talk to Wes and what they and, and so many other families are doing to help all of us really is remarkable. So thanks, Wes. I appreciate you coming on. I know you're busy. That was fun. Okay, so one thing many of us have, if not all of us have around, are glucose tabs, right? Even if you you don't use those for lows, chances are really good. You've got some chalky glucose tabs, you know, way back in the cabinet, or maybe you're like us and you try a new kind when it comes into the story. Oh, look, this says it tastes like s'mores, you know, and then it's really disgusting. So in our Shop Talk segment today, I was excited to meet Chris Angel. He is from Glucolift. And like all of our Shop Talk interviews, this was done at a diabetes conference. The idea here is to meet many of the exhibitors and vendors that go to these conferences. You can't get to all these conferences, so let's bring them to you. So I'll let Chris explain why he felt that glucose tabs really needed a makeover. Glucolift is pretty simple. It's just a glucose tablet, a chewable four gram tablet that looks a lot like the kind that you buy in drugstores. It's just, it doesn't taste a lot like the kind you buy in drugstores. This product uh, is something I developed. I was a late diagnosis. I was diagnosed when I was 30. And uh, because of being in the midst of a move and some insurance problems, I didn't get to see an endocrinologist for about eight months. And so I was put on fixed doses of both long acting and, and short acting insulin. That was after I got taken off metformin. And so I was basically low for six months, I would say five nights a week. It was the cold sweat, like fridge clearing lows. And so I had more glucose tablets in that period of time than than anybody should ever be forced to eat. And I I reached a point where I I just said, I I can't eat another one. They just struck me that the people who were making them never had to eat four of them at three in the morning. You know, it made my mouth feel like it was going to turn inside out. They were so hard to get down. This is me as a 30, 31 year old knowing, you know, exactly what was going on. There was no parent telling me I had to eat them. This was just me believing that this was the best thing to take. And I I reached the point where I, I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, I didn't have a, a background. I mean, I found other people who sort of knew how to make tablets, and I, I kind of worked with a, a separate flavor company, and then with them sort of saying, this is what I, I do want, this is what I don't want. And, and after some back and forth, um, we were able to get to it. And, and a lot of it was just sort of you know letting them know that you know when we're testing the samples, even the tablets that I like the least, you can eat half of one, and it's like, okay. But the minute you get up to the dose that, 
certainly in the adult or any, any kid over 100 pounds is going to eat when they're low, then that flavor just compounds and it's terrible. And so we started with the premise that this is not something that you're going to eat a, a half of in like a tasting session around a table. These are things that you're going to actually have to eat multiples of and they should be z designed so that they still taste good when you're eating you know, four or five. What's it like for you when you're at something like this and you've got the samples and I know you see people come up and they're like, oh, and then they taste it and they see the difference? It's funny because it happens every year and there's the parent who's like, oh, she doesn't like glucose tablets or he doesn't like glucose tablets. And they say, well, you know, I don't either. Do you want to try them? And I would say every day there's still one person who sort of has a little nibble and walks away and they don't want it. But nine times out of ten, you see this face change from skeptical into looking at you like you must be joking. Like, this is not a glucose tablet. This is something else. I mean, it feels great because I know that feeling from the kid's point of view, but then you see the look of relief on the parents' eyes because you just can't send your kid to school with eight juice boxes in their backpack because they break, they mold, they do all kinds of gross things. Glucose tablets may not be what you use every time. They're not what I use every time, but they are by far the easiest to measure, the easiest to carry, the least likely to go bad, the least likely to get eaten when you're not low. So they serve a really important function. And so the sort of look of surprise and delight on the kid's face and the look of relief on parents' faces, is it, it gets you every time. I wish I had a picture. I'll, I'll try to look up one and, and put it out on, on Facebook if I find it. The The conference table at the Glucolift table is so funny because they have a tasting, right? They have like little bowls. As he mentioned, you know, people are coming up and tasting. It, it's the kind of thing that reminds me of like, you know, you go to Costco or something. And would you like to try this, you know, wonderful little chicken tender? Or would you like to try, you know, and would you like to try this glucose tab? It's just so funny because it's a beautiful setup and it's a great product. But it certainly does make me laugh because, you know, I, I go over there. I try them too. I want to know what the flavors are. I have to tell you, though, we don't usually use glucose tabs. I don't, I, in other words, I don't really have a review on this one. Benny definitely prefers Gatorade gummies because he's so cool and athletic now and juice boxes or juice bottles at this point so they don't break in his backpack or his football bag. But I will say he is enamored with the case. T-Slim, I don't know if it was this time or last time, Tandem was handing out a little case, like a mint case, an Altoid case, with glucolift tabs inside. So he hasn't eaten one of them, but he has them with him all the time because he likes the way it looks. Go figure. All right, so much going on in the next couple of weeks. Traveling to the Unconference this weekend and the weekend for women. After that, I'm doing some local stuff here in the Charlotte area in November. In December, I'm also doing a talk for JDRF. I will be in Tampa. If you'd like me to come out and speak to your group, just let me know. I have a bunch of talks that I do on making in-person connections, on using social media to your advantage, not using it to your disadvantage. You know, there's a lot of fear and drama out there. And I also do one that another talk I love called She Just Doesn't Get It, which is about moms and kids, especially moms and teen daughters, and the way that we talk to each other. And I do have a teen daughter. She doesn't have type one, but uh, she's almost 16. And that is a different podcast altogether. But reach out to Stacy at diabetes-connections.com if you'd like me to come and speak to your group. Also, as I always remind you, really the best way to listen to the show is through a podcast app. Whether you are on Apple or Android, whatever app you're using to listen to your podcasts, maybe you're already there. Maybe you listen on social media. I know a lot of people listen through Facebook, which is great. But if you're listening on Facebook and you want to take it with you and you know it's not easy in the car get a podcast app, you can get the Diabetes Connections app. Very easy. Download that and you never miss an episode. We had a bonus episode last week. Hope you got that nice and easy. If you are a subscriber on any of the podcast apps, came right to you. It is so much fun to do this week after week. I appreciate you so much. Hey, big thanks to my editor, John Buchanis at Audio Editing Solutions, who always makes the show sound terrific. I appreciate you so much, John. And thanks to you as you listen. It is terrific. It's just great to spend an hour a week with people who get it. There's nothing like it around. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. I'm Stacy Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>